By his own account, Eric Zorn has written about 4,700 columns since 1986 and has left. Have you left now officially the Chicago Tribune, or you have a ways to go? I have about uh, 48 hours to go. I'm leaving on Friday at 5. So, Well, I'm very, very disappointed. You and your colleagues are leaving the Chicago Tribune. I'm in media. I've worked for radio stations that went out of business overnight, so I understand what you're going through. But is it sad, or is it exciting for a new opportunity? Well, of course, it's a little of both. And and the advantage that we have in this position, unlike in a lot of radio gigs, is that we were given plenty of notice when the buyout offer was coming. And then when we accepted the buyout, we have two weeks. And I've been able to continue to write columns uh, up until the end. So it's not like in radio where you're often just yanked off the air after your shift and you never get to say goodbye to your audience. And I've been able to say goodbye in my newsletter. I'll be able to say goodbye in my column. And so that eases the sting of this conclusion so much. But you ask whether it's sad or exciting. And, and of course, it's it, I'm really sad about it in a lot of ways. I, I um, would have liked to have gotten to an even 5,000 columns. Uh, I feel like I had a couple more years left in me. And that was my plan all along. I, I told my wife several times, I said, you know, I am going to stick with this. I'm going down with a ship. If they, they got to fire me, I got to, you know, they got to have to march me out of the office at the end of a prod holding my banker's box of uh, <laughs> house plants and statuettes. Yeah. And uh, I was going to, I was going to stay with it. And then, you know, they came along with a very generous offer to get the hell out. And so I took that offer uh, thinking that, well, you know, I'm 63 and I can, you know, I can have the energy and the time uh, to go after some other projects, whatever those might be. But uh I, I guess I'm not going to, you know, die with my boots on at the at the newspaper, but um... well, not at this newspaper. But uh, you know, content will always win, and there's a variety of avenues to get content out. We're obviously on a Zoom call now, relatively new technology, in a city of newspapers, which Chicago at one time was filled with great columnists and historically loaded with great columnists. Who are some of your biggest influences, if not here? I, I grew up in Michigan. I see the flag on the wall behind you. You went to University of Michigan. Detroit columnists I grew up reading. I grew up reading all these Chicago columnists. Who do you admire most? Did you read Bob Talbert when you oh, were growing up? Every, and I, I just thought the ponytail was odd, but I, I loved Bob Talbert, especially when he'd write about his friend Bob Seeger. I thought he was terrific. <laughs> Bob Talbert, this is really inside inside baseball in Michigan. So he's, every Monday he would write this column called Out of My Mind, Monday Moaning. Remember this? Yes. It was all a bunch of one-liners. Some of them were incredibly stupid, but some of them were very funny. And uh, and it was one of those things that I, I thought, if I ever got a column, I'm going to do something like that. And of course, I never did. But uh, I, I've only got one more day, so I think I'm I'm, I'm kind of done with that. But no, um, you know, in terms of of columnists, people like like Molly Ivins, if you remember her, uh, she's a writer down in Texas. Michael Kinsley, who mm -hmm. started Slate, I really like Bill Geist. Uh, who is the father of Willie Geist on MSNBC, but Bill was a columnist for the Tribune, and he wrote uh, this column called, uh, I don't know, it was just Bill Geist, and he wrote for the Suburban Trib, and it was this wonderful column of uh, just kind of humor and slices of life, and he kept wanting to come downtown, and the Tribune executives were saying, no, you're just a suburban reporter. Well, he got hired by the New York Times, and he <laughs> became a star out of, out of the New York Times doing exactly that. And and he was really my role model at one point in my career. And, uh, you know, I, I also really admired the the column writing and the, and the reporting skills of Bob Green. Uh, I know his career didn't end, it ended in an unpleasant way, but, man, that guy could write and he could report. And uh, he was someone who I who – I, admire a great deal. So that's just a few of the of the writers, uh, you know, sort of across the spectrum of, uh, of uh, interest from from politics to human interest that I've really admired over the years. I see my uh, my hounds are back. Things may get a little noisy. I apologize for that. Talking to you with Eric Zorn from the uh, Chicago Tribune. Um, as a political writer, you've obviously had a lot of slings and arrows sent your way. How do you deal with Internet trolls in this day and age? Well, I've discovered that it's possible basically to block people on Twitter. I don't, I don't literally block them, but I ignore them. I can have all their comments sent somewhere where I don't see them. Uh, and when people send me really unpleasant, hostile email, I do block them. I managed to curate my Facebook feed because it's essentially I find it's not that I can't take it. I certainly get enough hostile email and you know profane email and so on. I, I, I get that, and I 
and that's fine, but I don't find it very useful, kind of a waste of my time. And I've and I have really discovered that it is almost impossible to have a coherent conversation with anybody on Twitter. That Twitter is a great medium for some things. Uh, it's a great medium to find out what's going on and see what people are are chatting about, see what news stories are out there, see what other people are posting. But if you want to have a discussion with someone, it is a terrible place to do it. So I don't, I really try not to do that there. And I try to sort of ignore people who want to throw rocks at me. Uh, I don't mind getting into it on, on Facebook. And I really, I'm a real big believer in the idea of talking out issues and having, you know, civilized conversations about them. I, I feel like we've gotten away from that in our society these days that we, that too often we just like to uh, insult somebody or, or make a proclamation and score a point. And, and so it's just a shouting match across the divide. And I've, I've really always liked the kinds of uh, engagement that you can get on a good talk radio show, say where you have two people on and they're not trying to score points, but they're trying to like learn from each other a little bit about, well, where do we agree? Where do we disagree? How strong are our disagreements? I'm not saying this is a way that everyone's going to come to Kumbaya, but it's a way that I feel like you can lower the temperature. And social media is not a great place to lower the temperature. And that's and that discourages me a little bit. Biden said uh, at John Warner's funeral today that empathy is the engine of democracy. And I think you touched on it right there, that without empathy for one another, whether we have differences culturally or politically or geographically, that without empathy, it doesn't work. There's another saying I'd like to run by and have you respond to. Uh, long ago, somebody, and I can't give proper attribution, who said this, and I've repeated it a hundred times at least, that capitalism without ethics is chaos. Do you concur? Well, yeah, it's, it's fairly clearly that a lot of the rules and regulations we have is to is to make sure that we have c get controls on the capitalistic impulse, which I think is obviously is the engine of a very successful society, no question about it. But that without without controls on it, yeah, you do have chaos, definitely. And uh, that makes sense to me. Yeah. What are you going to miss most, Eric Zorn, in your in your farewell column that I read over the weekend? You said you're going to miss the trials or I'll miss not weighing in on the trials of Jesse Smollett, Alderman Ed Burke, who got into it with the mayor today at the city council meeting, Kyle Rittenhouse, and I hope ex-president Donald Trump. I've never seen in my lifetime a political figure like Don Donald Trump. Uh, the closest thing historically I can think about is uh, Huey Long, the senator and governor of Louisiana. Were you surprised or still stunned by the rise of Donald Trump and Trumpism, or did you expect that to come along? I, I was definitely surprised by it. I, I was predicting that he was going to flame out. Uh, I was secretly kind of pleased when he was doing well in the primaries, thinking that he was going to lose all 50 states. Uh, I, I admit to uh, having totally underestimated the appeal that he had to uh, Republican base voters. And, uh, and so I almost made me want to put away my prognostic, my, my crystal ball, because I, I, I like to try to predict the news every year. That was one of the things that I, I did every year was I had the readers weigh in on what they thought was going to happen. Then I'd weigh in, we'd compare our results the following year. And it almost made me say, well, this is useless. I was so wrong about Donald Trump. And so it's hard to even predict about whether he's, you know, people say, is he going to come back? Is he going to run again? And I said, look, you know, I, I have retired from the soothsaying <laughs> business. When it comes to Donald Trump, I can't, I can't tell. But yes, his rise definitely surprised me. And, uh, uh, you know, I, it, it, it's funny that you would look back that a lot of Democrats look back and go, boy, the good old days when George W. Bush was president, because, you know, the Democrats were up in arms about George W. Bush and they're horrified by George W. Bush. But I think George W. Bush has a certain uh, decency and, and uh, empathy, you know, and humility and empathy. Uh, like I didn't agree with him on, on a lot of things, but I got to say that I, I did think that he meant well and that he was a, a, a patriot. And uh, I, I don't think that about Donald Trump. I don't I don't think that he I, I think that he is a, a narcissist who's out for himself and who is a, a really poisonous figure in our politics. And uh, I'm, I'm, I'll be very sorry if he comes back. But I I'm said back in I said back in 15, I said, I don't think. He is temperamentally nor intellectually suited to be president of the United States. And after watching him in action, now I know he was not intellectually nor suited temperamentally to be president of the United States. Eric Zorn, are you going to continue to uh, 
play a lot of golf in your, we're not retiring, obviously, but will you have more time to play golf? And uh, if so, uh, would you like to come out and play golf one day? I would definitely. And I think you, uh, as, as John Dempsey healed yet from his surgeries, didn't he get, did he get an art? Is he getting like an artificial arm or something like that? Or two brand new hips, two brand new hips now. And he says he's hitting the ball like Bryson DeChambeau minus the back nine at the U S open. <laughs> well, yes, I definitely, I definitely have more time for golf. I'm going to have a lot more time for music. I hope. Um, and I am looking to start some other writing projects, but I'm not jumping in anything yet. Um, I like, like you asked me a little bit earlier what I'm going to miss and I am really going to miss just like listening to a show like yours or, or reading the paper and, and just reacting and thinking, well, I have a spot for that reaction. I've got, I have a platform. I can share this. I can start a conversation. And that's really what a, a columnist does. A columnist starts conversations. Uh, it used to be in the old days that a columnist would stand up on the hillside with his megaphone and tell people what to think. Now I, I look upon the role of a, of a columnist, someone who, who sort of convenes a conversation, gets, gets the ball rolling. And I'm going to miss the I'm miss like hell the opportunity to do that to you know when something happened today with Lightfoot and the city council and they and the uh, you know she, she got into a spat with them over her new city attorney and then she deferred the the Dusable uh, all the stuff I'm thinking I, I keep thinking I'm having reactions to it like I want to say something about it and I know that I can't uh, and I am going to miss that very much and and you must feel this too as a you know in times when you maybe even between jobs where something will happen and you won't have the microphone you you can't talk you can tell you can tell your family about what you think but but they're like dad shut up you know i i don't know i've never number one i've never been out of work since 1983 so i've been on wow. the radio constantly since 1983 that's got to be a record in american radio and most of that time here in chicago i've been fortunate that way um and I keep saying that the day, the day they turn me off, and I don't exactly fit the template of Doubledale's radio right now, that's mm -hmm. for sure. And I said, the day they turn me off, big deal. I have other pursuits, other things I want to do. But what is different between what I do and what you've done, you're in the pantheon of, you know, Chicago columnists. I mean, you really are. With okay. almost, uh, almost 5,000 columns at the Chicago Tribune. Uh, and, uh, and, you know, yours is there for all to see. It's in print, and it's... Uh, compiled and it's sequential. And a lot of what I do is I said, it's just, it's off to Venus. As soon as I say it, it's off in the ether. And until you publish, until you put pen to paper, I don't think it much matters. I'll be honest with you. I think I'm a very cheap version of a columnist uh, here in the city of Chicago. But that being said, I don't know if I'll miss just being able to flap my gums for three or four hours a day when they finally do turn me off. Really, because I, I well, you'll find out, I guess. But but uh, you know, I, when when I was presented with this offer and this opportunity, and thought about it, and talked to my wife about it, and and uh, I, I realized that I was going to, uh, I, I was thinking of all the possibilities it opens up. I said, golf with Big John Howell, come on, <laughs> honey, it's my chance. Um, but no, but I said, you know, I said, there are all, all these opportunities, things that I haven't. There are a lot of things that I just haven't done, projects I haven't looked into or started that I have a chance to, but, but I, I do, do know that, that this is such a part of my life and I can't believe it's not, you don't consider it part of your life too, where you've just, you know, you've been doing this for so long. And when you have a thought, it's, it's material for you. If something, if so, Mary Schmeek and I have talked about this before, where we're like, if something crummy happens to you, like at the car rental counter for everyone else, it's just something crummy, but for, for, columnist or, or talk show host it's material and you can get half an hour out of it you know <laughs> it's get it's 800 of, words out of it it's part of your job yeah so it's, and i i will i will miss that a great deal and i'm gonna have to get used to that i've been getting up early this week and reading the papers and i kind of wonder why am i doing this why am i reading the paper i don't i don't need to know what's going on i've got two more columns and they're kind of wrap-up columns and uh so 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 it's going to be a hard habit to break you know not getting up at five in the morning to read the papers uh, uh and then not having the outlet for it. it's gonna it's gonna be tough because it's been a long time since that's been been the case for me well we're really we're really gonna miss you i i loved reading you and all your colleagues i, I think it's a horrible mistake by the tribune the only reason i subscribe to the tribune the sun times the daily herald the wall street journal the new york times the washington post I can get my news from my phone, you know, here I can get my news feed from Twitter, as you mentioned, but I buy those papers and on Sunday I get the paper, paper, paper that I can hold and read. 
uh, the reason I subscribe to those papers is for columnists. And I, I'm, I think the Tribune's making a big mistake. I don't know what their plans are. I'm not in management, but I will miss you. I know I'll be able to find you at some point. Let's golf. Who are some of your favorite fiddlers, by the way? Oh, Jay, Joe DiCosimo is one of my favorite fiddlers. Uh, Raina Gellert, uh, Aaron Marshall. You don't know any of these people. They're very, they're, they're old time fiddlers, but they're great. Great. Well, I, I was just listening. My, I, as we were setting up the Zoom call, I was sending some audio downtown uh, and I said, let me play in honor of Eric. Uh, let me play Mark O'Connor. Mark O'Connor is fabulous. He, you know, he's more bluegrass. I play more old time square dance fiddling, which is, you know, my, my son is into bluegrass. You're going to hear about him one of these days. He's a terrific bluegrass fiddler, so can't keep up with him. But I'm going to try. He's living at home now with us, so I get to get to play with him and, and learn from him. So that's kind of cool, too. Eric Zorn, it's a pleasure always uh, talking to you. I guess congratulations on the next chapter of your professional life, and thank you for joining us here on WDLS. Thanks. I'll see you on the links, all right?